It's great to be here today with you, Dario. Um, uh, it's great having a director of safety with us, uh, in this case, uh, director of safety of AI systems uh, at OpenAI. Um, thanks for joining us today and, and, and just give a fabulous lecture. And um, folks out there who see this fireside chat who have not seen your lecture yet, this is a pointer to the lecture. Um, what I found remarkable is, in, term, in terms of uh, similarity between us is that we've had similar pasts. And just talk a little bit about how you got to where you are now. It's an interesting trajectory towards the world of intelligence and into the notion of onto safety and robustness. But you started out in physics. Um, and um, how, talk, tell me a bit about how that progressed to where you are. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, when, when I was young, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to, you know, figure, figure out how the universe works, wanted, wanted to be a physicist, wanted to drive Derive fundamental laws, um, and then uh, so I did my undergrad in that. And when I when I went to grad school, which was was also in, in physics, I got really interested in you know what what ca what can kind of you know the both the, the methods and the recording devices from physics tell us about neuroscience and the brain and intelligence. And you know I thought of kind of doing 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 AI at that time, but I felt like you know I really wanted to I really wanted to understand the brain because like you know the the only existing example of you know a truly truly intelligent system. Um, so I spent a fair amount of time doing that in uh, in in grad school. Did did uh, kind of a postdoc in uh, in computational biology, um, and then uh, through Stanford got to know about uh, uh, a speech research project going on at Baidu under under Andrew Ng. So I was there. Then I was at uh, then I was at Google for a year, and then a little over a couple of years ago I joined. Joined OpenAI, and sometime around when I was working on, on things at, at Baidu and and, and Google, uh, just got a lot of experience with kind of the the brittleness of neural nets. Uh, how um, you know, th th in one sense, they're very robust and powerful, um, but that when you go off, you know, some given some given distribution, that they don't they don't do so well, and that you know. Uh, it uh, you know it, it's it's hard to understand really what's what's uh -huh. go, what's going on inside them and particularly that in the long run is you know we make systems more more powerful these these problems are, are only going to get worse so uh, decided that was what I wanted to work but, on. But going back, I mean we'll, we'll come back to where you are now and the great research that you're doing with your team. But going back to this um, this decision or this deep curiosity about. What's going on in brains and neurobiology? What, 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 what was the spark of that? And uh, yeah, um, I mean, you know, when I when I got to Princeton for grad school, there were a few biophysicists there working on, uh, <clears throat> you know, like models of the models of neural circuits based on statistical mechanics. And having done a fair amount of statistical mechanics as a, as a physicist, I was I was really interested in, you know, what what you know what what can we what can we say with these kind of you know, statistical models that, that are based on thermodynamics about the brain, can it give us any insight? You know, just mm -hmm. in, in vague terms, like, you know, a lot of people were kind of analyzing single neurons, saying here's a circuit, this neuron does this, that neuron does this. Maybe things are more about the population and the statistical properties, and that seemed very intuitive to me, so I kind of wanted to, wanted to, wanted to you know, devote myself to looking into it. And do you feel like in advance of your work in AI, you came away with any intuitions or insights about what the heck's going on in, in, in vertebrate brains? Yeah. If, if, if any brains, we'll throw I mean, invertebrates in there too. It, yeah, it's, it, it, it's hard. I mean, I think one lesson I learned about the field of neuroscience is that it's very limited by our ability to measure what's going on in, in the brain. Theory is overdetermined. Uh, you know, uh, it's actually very, very much like in, in particle physics, right? Where you can come up with a whole bunch of theories, but if you only have a little bit of data, then there, there are too many theories that could fit that data. So, so in neuroscience, we're, we're always kind of trying to get, to get more data. Um, and I spent a lot of my PhD trying, trying, trying to do that with, you know, at least, at least some, some success, although, you know, much, uh, much, much less than I would have, would have, uh, would have hoped for, you know, that, that, that I think the field needs to really, to, to really, to really understand things. Um, you know, uh, you know, I did get some instincts that you know things like you know simple reinforcement learning approaches uh, may may be in some ways on the on the right track. You know, if you look at 
you know, if you look at hippocampus, um, you know, there are things that, that look like temporal difference policy updates happening that look look surprisingly surprisingly much like it. So the idea that, that RL is a is is a piece which you know kind of really has ended up being being right right in the field was like one of the, one one of the lessons that I one of the lessons that I drew. So it, it was great reading about um, your earlier work and your work you did um, during grad school in neurobiology. Um, it was fun to talk to you over lunch uh, just now where we compared some notes in that at Microsoft Research, we have had a collaboration with, with Bill Christan's team at UCSD taking the latest in ML tools, machine learning and, and visualization to try to understand what's going on with sets of neurons, in this case in the medicinal leech and you working in the salamander. Yeah, um, so uh, yeah, I've done some work on uh, salamander retina and you know, we were really just kind of the logic there was to try and you know understand uh, you know the nervous system of a complex animal by taking a kind of separable piece of it where you know with the salamander retina you can fully control what goes in goes into the salamander retina and then look at what goes up the optic nerve and so you have this kind of sandbox that's an isolated piece of the brain you can control the inputs observe the outputs and look at what's happening to every every neuron in between and you know, what we focused on was trying to record from a large number of these neurons and saying, what is the whole population of neurons doing? What is, what is, it, what is it coding for? How does it collectively communicate, communicate information? And, you know, it got me thinking about these kind of higher, higher level questions about, about intelligence. Yeah, I, I've just personally been, been blown away by what evolutionary biology discovered it could do with cells and tangles of cells. Uh, to do cognition, whether it be invertebrates or vertebrates, it's, to me, I, I would I would certainly have stuck with neurobiology if I thought I could make better progress. I don't know if you feel the same way or not. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. I mean, we're very much limited by by data. Um, you know that uh, you know when we have a very limited amount of data, uh, then you can come up with all kinds of theories for it, and it's kind of overdetermined. Too many of your theories fit the data, so we're always trying to collect more data and, and I wanted to make these kind of theories and models but spent most of my time you know improving the data and, and had I think some success with that uh, but you know um, if if I felt that we were really at the point where you know we could report record millions of neurons pour through the data and try try and try and try and analyze it uh, and we knew, and we knew the data was accurate, and we could correlate it to stimuli and human behavior and the thoughts in humans had. Then, then we could kind of really have a mature science of neuroscience. Um, and, and probably, probably if that was the case, then then I would have stayed in the field. But I, I really felt we were limited in in what we could do and what we could record, and that uh, actually AI was answering our questions in more interesting ways. So I think for people like you and I, AI is our neuroscience right now. Yeah, I would I would say so. Moving into into your work in in um, jumping to it to an to an AI company, going from a postdoc, I guess, in, into Baidu, it's an interesting yeah. jump. And how did that happen exactly? Yeah, so I mean, uh, very much kind of just just as you just mentioned, uh, you know, I ended up picking up a fair amount of ML along the way when we were doing like spike signal sorting for the neural arrays. You know, just 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 as you mentioned, just the pure signal processing tasks, never even mind the, the neuroscience, you know, it ends up using a lot of machine learning and, and pattern recognition. And so I was, you know, I, you know, I would say I was kind of like an, an, an amateur in the field, but not someone who didn't know, know anything, know anything about it. And then when I found out about uh, this, this effort as ba at Baidu, it was kind of just, just as it was getting started, um, you know, I felt like uh, it was really, it was really, really an opportunity. Um, so, you know, I kind of went away and you know, studied, studied, you know, convolutional neural nets and recurrent neural nets for, you know, for for, for a while, and, and, and ended up getting getting hired. And I kind of, kind of, uh, you know, really enjoyed it and never looked back. In your work on speech, for the leaps that you you were able to to, to push out, what were some of the techniques and insights that you were, that, that helped you out there in, in terms of getting those new results. Yeah, um, so a fair amount of it was just uh, kind of pure scale and, and engineering. So I was more on the ML side, but also kind of worked with the, um, you know, the the systems folks. So I think one of the things that the Baidu lab uh, was successful at was you know using synchronous stochastic gradient descent before other people did. Uh, 
I think you would describe what that means to you. Yeah, to so, uh, so basically uh, the standard, the, the way, you know, when kind of the AI results first started coming out of Google in Toronto in 2012, the standard thing was asynchronous uh, uh, gra gradient, gradient descent. So this was done within Google, very much kind of like the web server model where, you know, each machine has a batch and uh, e each machine computes the gradients of that batch and there's some central server that, you know, that has the value of all the parameters. The, the parameter and, server. Yeah, parameter yeah. server and the gradients yeah. get applied. And so this, it's asynchronous because I can be calculating the gradients of one model and apply it to some new model that's been updated in the, in the meantime. Synchronous gradient descent is more like I have all these machines, they compute gradients, they do a big all reduce, sum up all the gradients and apply that gradient to everything. So like the, the whole set of machines takes one big step and then one big step and then one big step. Um, that turns out to have benefits in terms of kind of re reproducibility and also seems to in some contexts lead to better results. Do you think part of that was just the, this, just the advance in computation at the time? Yeah, that's, that's what, about what I was about to get to. A lot of the stuff we did in speech, um, you know, was, was just our ability to kind of scale things up, use more compute, collect more data. We even kind of made these graphs of like how much better do you do as a result of, you know, number of parameters, if the architecture is right, number of, um, you know, like the, the amount, of, amount of data that you use. And you see these very smooth log log plots that, you know, after, after I left Baidu, they explored this some more and it turned into this paper called Deep learning training is deep learning scaling is predictable empirically, and uh, that's been one thing that shaped my my thinking. That kind of once you know, once you once you have the the paradigm for for how to solve a particular task, right? Once you have all the conceptual stuff right, then the scaling has these super smooth properties to it. Now it's, it's clear that um, there's been for you know a number of years now. Uh, excitement, exuberance uh, about the possibilities of, of breakthroughs in AI, also fears, uh, mm -hmm. anxieties, and these uh, different opinions on which way things might go and whether there are, are, are deep concerns to be uh, grappled with or it's time to celebrate immortality through, through uh, the advent of powerful uh, machinery that could that could we, we could jump into someday from the point of view of some people have captured the attention of the public uh, and some and some technologists and some scientists and I'm curious um, if 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 that was the context in which you started working in safety what how did you get going on the yeah so safety you know, I, front, I think I think I front? was uh, kind of you know uh, aware of some of the kind of more more uh, more extreme views in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, safety and you know in many cases I thought people were it was true kind of like jumping ahead of themselves or um, you know not not thinking about the the problem in the right way but at the same time I thought that there was really a kernel of important truth uh, to some some of what they, they were saying which is that you know if you have a powerful AI system and you know today we have somewhat powerful AI systems but they're getting more more and more powerful every day um, that you know th and if that system does has goals, objectives that are not aligned with the ones you want them to be, um, that, that that can lead to, to accidents, to catastrophic, uh, to catastrophic behavior. Um, you know, my, my perspective on it, the perspective that I, you know, that, that I, I hope I've helped to kind of to bring to the safety field is this empirical perspective of let's look at, let's look at today's systems. If you think of some problem that you might might have in the future, some safety issue that you might have with future powerful AI systems, can you kind of build a replica of that today in, you know, in today's systems to study the problems conceptually and build kind of durable safety approaches so that if the AI system gets more powerful, the safety approach gets more gets powerful, powerful along with it. And you know, someday we'll have we'll have Super intelligent machines, and then I hope that 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 day, that on that day, we've we've been spending many years making the safety of systems systems better and better, and so it's it's a problem that when we finally do face it, we we do know how to grapple with it. I think it's it's um, just reflect a bit in real time. There are different, often unstated uh, intuitions about what the concerns are, notions of oh, something might go wrong, and there's some costly outcome. But it's noticed and seen, and yeah. people shut a system down, or they, or they address uh, an issue and make a system better. There's the idea of 
something big happens and it's hard to ever stop it. And it's long-term uh, oppression of human beings. And or, there's a third notion of, even further many more, of something is going wrong very, very under the hood and implicitly it's, having, it's creating some, some nuances in the world that make us unhappy as individuals or makes our society, it's costly to the society, like even how automation might shift, uh, cause more inequity in wealth, for example. And, and I'm curious which, you know, sort of where do you think you, 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 the concerns yeah, are and what, I mean, what you're addressing? Like all, all, all of the above to different, <laughs> to different degrees, right? Um, so, you know, I think, I think there could be kind of unitary problems where we build a specific AI system where we want it to do X and it instead does Y. But that's, and, but that's noticed. Yeah, and it's, it's noticed, but, but maybe something catastrophic happens before, before we, we notice it and we, we <laughs> correct it, but, you know, but, but damage was done. I mean, this is the case in self-driving cars. They have problems, people you know, crash, eventually some people will die, you know, already, already have. Um, and then if we, if, we, if we increase the stakes to you know, systems that are making you know, important decisions for you know, the, the economy, the financial system, hu humanity as a whole, these kind of discrete uh, dangers certainly, certainly can happen. At the same time, uh, this kind of like diffusion throughout the economy of kind of uh, a a AI systems like you know, subtly changing society in some way or changing the economy or changing how humans relate to 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 each other in a way that's like, you know, could be could be really bad, but that we don't notice right away. I mean, I'm, I'm very, you know, I think there are opportunities for that as well. Um, of course, there are also opportunities for, you know, for for AI to have positive effects of that of that type, um, you know, to, um, you know, help humans make make better decisions to understand themselves better to, to do to do to do all kinds of things like that so I, I see both the, the positive uh, you know the positive and the negative in in the paper you wrote a few years ago I think this was uh, you know maybe your coming out uh, a manuscript that you were going to be taking a serious look at at safety issues as a as a co-author you mentioned you know five concrete you know, types yeah. of problems you saw. You know, just pick a few and mention, talk a little yeah. bit about these, these, these yeah. concerns. So uh, the one that uh, people ended up uh, kind of uh, liking the most was uh, re reward hacking. So it's this, this idea that, you know, you're trying to get an AI system to do something complicated, like, you know, some, some you know, complicated, some complicated human activity, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, like uh, just, just some, uh, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but uh, you know, you have some simple, simple proxy for it. I don't know. Example would be like uh, you know, trying to help humans connect to each other better, or something like that, or make humans happier. And you have some simple proxies that are usually correlated with it, and you start to optimize one of the proxies. And as you do more and more op optimizing of the proxy, it kind of starts to diverge from the thing you're ultimately trying to get. Right? Uh, you know, you like a lot of. A lot of a uh, lot of tech products. Uh, it's really easy to measure like engagement or clicks, um, and you know they're kind of used as a lazy proxy for the user is getting what they want and the user is enriching themselves. And that's 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 maybe true before you optimize heavily for it, but once you optimize heavily for it, that correlation can break. And so, noting that this is a general problem for reinforcement learning systems and you know whatever comes after reinforcement learning systems, RL plus plus. It's a it's a general feature of you know, it's a general feature of systems that are throwing a lot of optimization power and compute to pursue a unitary goal. You showed a, a really uh, uh, expressive video of, of uh, what one of your systems did when it discovered how to, how to hack a value function, or an objective, I should say, more generally. Yeah. Um, we could describe that, that, that game and, yeah. and, the, and the result. Yeah, so it's, it's this boat race game. I've probably, probably shown this video a, a, bunch, a bunch of times. But people who haven't seen that need yeah. to sort of cl click on that link. They'll find it somewhere. Yeah, sure. so it's like this boat is supposed to be completing this boat race. And, you know, the, 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 the way it's set up is, uh, you know, I was training this among, you know, hundreds, hundreds of other games, so I didn't look too closely at the reward function. But the, the way it's set up within the game is you get points for, you know, hitting these targets along the along the along the course and then you know points for finishing the race and so you would think well that incentivizes it's not quite the same as saying finish the the race but you would think it would incentivize the agent to finish the race 
But it turns out that the boat can find this isolated lagoon and uh, basically spin around in this perfectly designed circle <laughs> in order to keep getting these power-ups just as they regenerate. Um, and it, it can get such a high density of points that it's like, I don't even need to finish the race. I'm just going to find this lagoon and spin around in it forever. Yeah. I mean, certainly, um, yeah, certainly showing that video is a way to, you know, you, you can save 30 minutes of a, of, of a presentation to say, look at this video. Here's, here's what happened with these methods. Uh, and get to uh, sort of push the point through very clearly. The um, uh, other, other of these um, uh, challenges to AI systems in the open world uh, include notions that I would say are captured by the, um, the classic frame problem in AI, yeah. which talked about the notion that um, AI systems really didn't have enough knowledge to understand the current state, the qualification problem. And when they took an action in the world, they really didn't understand the ramifications uh, uh, given how much knowledge you would need to, to understand all the possible effects of action. And I, I get the sense that uh, that could characterize a lot of what we're seeing now in modern AI uh, as we work with these probabilistic systems. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's very true. I mean, it's what I had in mind with, with some of the safety problems, right, that the world is a really big place and uh, agents are, are agents' brains are relatively small. Humans' brains are right. relatively small. There's much more in the world that can ever can ever fit fit in, fit in your head. And also, at least for our reinforcement learning agents, the reward functions are even smaller. Um, and so, you know, there's no way we're going to capture all the subtlety, right? Even even humans are not going to understand the world. They have a bunch of heuristics. They have a bunch of ways to compress it. But even then, it's not perfect. And then, if we're crippling things further by by you know having these these very kind of hacky proxies for reward functions that just seems to me like a recipe for, for things going wrong. And if you could just reflect now, we, 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 I think you spent um, time today during your distinguished lecture um, talking about your current direction, which is to figure out, which is also a very shared goal with Microsoft research um, efforts in this, in this realm, how to weave human intellect into the process of designing and guiding these systems. Say a little bit more about how that, what sparked that whole direction in your work right yeah. now. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, the, you know, the original uh, work, work on that uh, about a year and a half ago now was, uh, you know, myself and one of the people in my group, uh, Paul, Paul Cristiano, um, who'd been, been writing, on one hand, Paul had been writing about things uh, similar to this for, for a while. I got very excited about it from a safety perspective. And I think there's, you know, also fairly rich academic literature on, uh, you know, putting humans into the, into the training loop. But a lot of it kind of hadn't caught up to the power, power, power of RL systems and it hadn't been done for deep learning. We really didn't know if it was something that worked at scale. So, you know, we said, you know, let's, let's see if on modern, modern RL tasks and modern, modern AI systems, we, we can make this, you know, put humans in the loop during training uh, in order to tell AI systems what their goals should be and what human values they should embody. And then, then at test time, the agents can act completely, completely autonomously. This seemed like, uh, you know, a really, a really appealing approach because it means the AI system can in the end act completely autonomously, but because it's interacted with humans during training, it kind of embodies a picture of human human values and human directives and goals. And so, you know, we spent a few months try, trying to get that to work and, you know, found that for you know, a lot of the modern modern RL tasks, we could, in fact, get it to work. And so a lot of our work more recently has kind of branched off that. And it seems that there's several different approaches to that. Um, uh, We've done a, a number of projects where we try to characterize human intellect, characterize machine intellect, understand blind spots, understand where each uh, agent does a great job, and understand how to do the handoffs um, or, or the synthesis of these intellects. And the interesting work you just talked about was about, for example, humans providing hints, feedback, uh, shaping of the, of, the util of the utility function and the reinforcement reward. Um, it seems that there are several different ways to go uh, in this front. So, I mean, you, uh, what's, what are some interesting directions there? Yeah. So, you know, as, as, as you mentioned, the, the original paper was kind of like, you know, agent gives some examples of, you know, what it's, its behavior to the human and, and asks, you know, which of these are best, what is more like what you want me to do. And, you know, it's 
in the original paper, it was like a binary choice. It was like, you know, is the left better or the right better? Now we're expanding in, in various directions. The thought is, you know, can, can the human give feedback to the AI system in natural language? Um, or can it give feedback kind of more indirectly? Can one AI system help a human understand how to train another AI system? Um, so that's kind of a more, more complicated way of having humans and existing AIs work together to train more powerful AIs. Um, we're also kind of, uh, you know, thinking, thinking of, of going, going in a more uh, like language, language focused direction. Um, we're thinking of combining it with other techniques. A common technique in reinforcement learning is, uh, you know, Im imitation learning, where human demonstrates a task a bunch of times, and an AI system looks at that and tries to copy it or learn what the human is doing. So that's kind of another way to get humans involved. And I think our general vision is like, how do we you know, tr let's work to try and find ways to combine all of these features together because it's a little how, how, how children learn. They learn by copying adults. They learn by getting feedback on whether mm -hmm. what they're doing is good or not. Sometimes they just know the answer and they learn from that and it's not really any one thing. It's a mix of all those things. And what are some of your thoughts on applying these methods someday to build uh, a system that has the, the, the ethical insights and uh, wisdom that we might expect from a sage we'd look up to when it comes to hard decisions. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the ultimate ambition of, of, the, of this sort of thing. I mean, obviously there's a lot of things between, uh, between what, what we can do now and, and that, just as there's a lot of things between, you know, a, a, between today's AI systems and AI systems that are as good at, at humans at, at everything. Um, but, you know, I think, um, you know, we're, we're trying to kind of gradually, you know, scale up, introduce new methods, make progress by pieces. I think one feature that'll be really important is in using, using humans to train AI systems. Um, you know, there are a number of biases that humans have and a number of kind of limitations in humans understanding their own values and being able to impart their own values. Um, so we're actively looking for collaboration with, uh, you know, social, social scientists, behavioral psychologists, cognitive scientists, economists, uh, that, the, those, those types of people to help us to design those experiments, right? We think this isn't purely a technical problem. It has kind of a, like a social science component to it as well. Uh, and we're hoping increasingly as we move to harder tasks to get social scientists more involved. I get the sense that you're an optimist overall about where technology is going. Is, is that true? Um, I mean, I think, I think I'm, yeah, I think I'm an optimist overall um, in the sense that I think if we're thoughtful uh, about how to use, uh, how to use, you know, technology, um, it's, uh, you know, that, that if we think really hard about it, it is possible to get, to get a good outcome. You know, at the same time, it, like it, I, I hesitated a little because I think it, it really, it really depends on us and it depends on how things are used, right? If I look at the way kind of a lot of social media stuff was, was, was rolled out, um, you know, and just the, the effects it's had on, you know, kind of, kind of democracy and elections over the last few years, like we didn't think any, about any of that stuff ahead of time. And, you know, as, as a result, while these technologies have had positive impacts, they've, they, you know, we're, we're just seeing, we're starting to see their negative side as well. Um, and so it, 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 it's hard to be kind of like a, you know, like a, like, like, like a starry eyed, unmitigated optimist. And, you know, when you see that, when you see that all around you. Um, but the lesson I take from it is that with, with AI, we shouldn't let that happen. We should instead think about everything. We should think about the downsides ahead of time. Um, we shouldn't have a culture where we like, you know, where we kind of attack people for thinking about the downsides. Um, it's like an important function that I think is actually core to actually getting the tech, actually getting the technology to work, actually getting it to deliver its benefits. Um, and that if we, if we don't have these thoughts and if we don't have these conversations, then there's gonna be this backlash. So let's push on optimism for a second. What, what, what are some, just give me, speculate with me. If, uh, yeah. It's 15, 20 years from now, what do we see? Uh, where are we with AI in terms of applications, theory? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, in terms of in terms of applications, I mean, you know, if there, 
you know, as you, you know, you mentioned we both we both kind of share this background of having thought about you know neuro 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 neurobiology and just kind of you know the the structure of the brain and the structure of biochemistry. Uh, you really get this sense looking at the problems of biology that they're like beyond human scale, right? You know, <laughs> if you look at these these charts of me metabolism. You know, every <laughs> every you know, every, every, every cell has, Don't, you don't know, remind me of having to memorize yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> terrible. Um, you know, every cell has 7,000 different, you know, kinds of proteins that get expressed out of, you know, 30,000 or so genes. And, you know, the some proteins have one copy, some have a million copy. Some of them are like phosphorylated, some of them aren't. And it's, it's just no human can remember it. There's all this data. We're using machine learning a little bit to kind of like, analyze pieces of the data, but, you know, it, it really, it seems to me that, uh, you know, this is almost a problem tailor-built for machines. Um, and so I'm, 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 I'm hopeful, and I've heard, I've heard other people, uh, you know, even, even at Microsoft saying, 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 the same, saying the same thing, and, and I think it's like a correct optimistic vision. I, I really hope that, you know, we can, we can you know, use, use AI to take over more of the scientific process, maybe all, someday all of the scientific process, um, and you know, cure you know, long, kind of long-standing diseases like cancer that just have this complexity that, that we have a hard time reckoning with. Similarly, you know, for things like, uh, like, like uh, you know, global, global warming or, or, or you know, you know, energy problems, just technology problems in general, which you know, all, you know, all told humans aren't really that great at. So it's 25 years from now. Yeah. Something costly has happened that people say that was a problem with AI. Yeah. Uh, what's your kind of best guess at what 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 had happened over that that period of time? I mean, there's lots of like there's lots of kinds of things that could go wrong. Um, I mean, I think when I think about kind of the the accident stuff, right? There's there's the kind of the, the, the most extreme scenario is, you know, the world, the world gets destroyed. And I think that's, uh, you know, there, there are scenarios where that, that, where that could happen. For instance, uh, if you had AI systems managing nuclear weapons or something like that. Um, if a country turned over its, you know, national defense to, to AI or something like that, and the AI kind of wasn't, uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't well designed in the sense that it didn't even do what it was, what it was, what it was, you know, what, what it was designed to do. Systems that are supposed to kind of, you know, manage, manage the economy. Um, you know, if we really get to the point where we're really putting the whole world's trust in AI systems, then I do think there are extreme outcomes that, that, that could happen. On the, on the, on the less extreme side, just, uh, you know, things like, you know, pro economic, economic crashes, uh, you know, systems, systems being, being unsafe, causing, causing kind of, kind of, kind of individual, uh, causing individual casualties on the kind of like social misuse and responsibility side. Um, you know, I think the, the invasiveness of the potential invasiveness of, of, of AI technology could have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of concerns related to, you know, pervasive surveillance and, and things like that. Um, just, uh, you know, mis misuse, misuse of, a of misuse of AI in general by, uh, by, by, by nation states, uh, you know, changing, changing the world, world balance of power. So, so turning from, from your, your thoughts about the future to maybe uh, some, some current questions from uh, some folks watching this, uh, especially with regards to career, you've had such an uh, illustrious career even uh, uh, given how early you are in your career, uh, going through many different phases of interest, following um, kind of the natural terrain of your curiosity. Uh, I'm curious if you, what, what your advice might be to, to folks thinking about uh, their major in college or their graduate work and, and beyond. Yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely think that, you know, AI, AI and machine learning, you know, are gonna, gonna continue to be uh, you know, you know, just a just a big player in the general advance of technology. I mean, even if we stopped all kind of research advances today, just the pure applications would be would be of, of what we already have would be economically transformative. And I don't think that the research advances are gonna get a ground gonna ground to a to a standstill. Uh, so you know, I think it's a, it's you know very promising career direction. Uh, you know, I really encourage people to you know, think about the social, social implications. Um, you know, it's just a number of like undergrads and, and, and young people do seem to already be thinking about that. So it seems like people are thinking, you know, thinking, thinking in the right, right direction. I've just met a lot of, you know, like a lot of people who, 
you know, se seem like they're, they, they just ge genuinely care about, you know, both advancing the technology and making sure that it's, it's, it's good for the world. Um, one, one piece of advice I have is, uh, you know, I really think uh, ML and AI are becoming like much more kind of hands-on uh, fields. And, uh, you know, instead of, instead of waiting to kind of, uh, you know, like take grad school courses in them or, or, or that, 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 that sort of thing that like, just like, you know, ch like checking out GitHub repos for like all the, all, the, all the latest models, trying to implement them yourself, trying to tinker them with them yourself. I mean, I think it started, you know, j just as kind of, you know, you know, pr like programming used to be academic computer science, and then it, you kind of moved to, you know, become more of a practical discipline. I think, I think AI or many parts of AI are much more moving to be be this kind of pr practical discipline that, you know, it's it's about your ability to pattern match. And so, you know, you, you, you want to get cycles of iteration in very early. You want to implement lots of stuff. You want to know, know models back and forth. You also need to know the theory. But, uh, you know, like uh, there's uh, there's less of that than, it, than, than there used to be. And a lot of it is kind of starting to consolidate. Well, great. Well, it was fabulous talking to you today. Thanks very much, Dario. Thanks for having me.